All right, Star. Star, Hi. Star, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Um, East Tennessee. And tell me about your family. You had both your parents growing up? Mm, not the whole time. Um, I grew up in, um, like the first 12 years of my life, I had two moms. Um, it was my sister and I. And then um, they split up and I moved in with my dad to another town in East Tennessee um, with my father, my stepmother, and my two brothers. Um, and that's when my dad became like a bigger presence in my life. Um, he and my mom split when I was two because he um, he was pretty violent and um, with all of us. Uh, so yeah, she moved on and found happy, I suppose. And left you with your dad? Um, no, I mean like she left him and um, the first 12 years of my life were um, like blissfully happy. Uh, it was my choice to move in with my dad and probably, probably the first worst mistake in my life. Um, what, what, what do you say that? Um, he was, he was very, um, physically and verbally abusive, emotionally. Um, but I guess... Uh, it took me a long time to stop being so angry. Now that I'm a mo when I became a mother, um, I've got four kids now. Um, my parents were really young when they had me. They were 16 and 17. Um, and I think that they just, uh, they both made the best out of a bad situation and did their best. And something about me just, um, trip my dad's trigger out of all four of us kids I'm the only one he laid hands on um to the best of my knowledge he never he never hit my stepmom um it's kind of a common thing growing up like my first boyfriend in high school um middle school and high school it was four years long that turned physically abusive too he beat the crap out of me um and then my husband 11 years we were married he had never hit a woman before in his life but it took less than a year um for him to start <clears throat> lashing out at me so <clears throat> excuse me um so I'm, like I'm, I'm I'm not some like fragile victim that thinks that you know, everything's my fault. But I do think, like, three completely different men, I'm the common denominator. Like, there's got to be something about me that, um, I guess, like, at a minimum brings out the worst in men. So the abuse from your father was mostly physical, or was it sexual or anything else? Um, no, it was physical, mostly. Um but it was pretty bad. Um, I remember when I was like 16, being called into the principal's office at school. Um, I was taking a CNA course at the time and I guess my teacher, the nurse saw the bruises on my face, even though I tried to cover them up with makeup. And there was a counselor and a principal in there and asked me what happened to my face and I lied and said that a big bin of ketchup fell on it at work um I don't know why but I always wanted to um I never wanted to see him in trouble I guess some part of me even the first time that he ever hit me in the face I was 12 even then I didn't I didn't tell anybody I didn't um I didn't want to see him in trouble. I just, <clears throat> I just didn't want him to do it again. And I guess I thought, 
like I, I mean I loved him too I didn't I didn't want to see him in trouble and I guess I thought like if I said something that I maybe get taken away from my family or things would get worse so I'm not nearly as angry now as I was back then, but one thing that does fuck me up pretty bad is I have um, my oldest child, my son. He, um, about a year ago, um, at almost exactly the same age I was the first time dad hit me, did exactly the same thing I did to get hit. And it was so very easy not to hit him. Oh, I was, I was angry and, um, disappointed, but all I had to do was look at his face and, um, no part of me wanted to strike him or hurt him. And that kind of sent me back at square one. Like I thought I was done being angry, but, um, I'm not. Because now, because I made excuses all this time, like I was just, you know, a difficult teenager and I wouldn't listen and I was rebellious and whatever. But <clears throat> I have one of those at home. And like I said, it's so easy not to hit him. So I don't understand why it was so easy to hit me so much and so hard, I guess. Okay, so um, yeah, I had my bags packed about a month before I turned 18. Um, I was ready to leave and um, I left and I got my own apartment. Um, <clears throat> got pregnant with my son when I was 18. Um, I was, um, by the time he was about nine months old, I was working full time at a nursing home, going to school for nursing full time. And I was a single mom. Um, and then the drug started. Um, I got hurt at work and they put me out of work for just six weeks and gave me pain pills. Um, I remember when I ran out of the pain pills, um, I thought I was losing my mind. I didn't realize what was actually happening. I didn't know anything about withdrawal. Um, even though most of my family members were junkies, I, that just wasn't part of my world. Um, I was going to be a nurse and be somebody, right? So um, my aunt, I guess, recognized what was wrong with me and handed me um, a much stronger pill. And she was like, here, take this. It'll make you feel better. And I remember it did. Um, in a matter of minutes, I was in the floor playing with my son and cleaning the house, and I felt like superwoman. And quickly, within probably three or four months of that day, I went from just taking pills to snorting them to slamming them. And then it was heroin because it was cheaper. Um, then my son's father filed for emergency custody when he found out, and... I went to a 90 day inpatient program because it was that or lose my son. And I completed it, um, came out and got high like two days later. Started stealing from the people that I love the most and screwing everybody over. And um, it all pretty much caught up to me. Um, so I took off for Oklahoma, which is where my biological grandfather and his wife, my mamma, um, and my aunt lived, and my baby cousins. Um, my plan was to run away and get better and come back for my son. Um, and it didn't exactly work that way. Um, I knew from an early age that my grandfather was a pedophile, but, um, he, he was allowed in our home until I was probably 
looking at the pictures, probably six or seven, and then Mama cut off all contact with them. Um, and it just so happens that the neighborhood that my father lived in, my grandfather's best friend also lived in. And um, <clears throat> when I met him, he put me in contact with my family from Oklahoma and from like 12 until 18, um, had a relationship with all of them by phone. Um, and I would meet up with them, sneak and meet up with them when they come to Tennessee. Um, and he seemed like he was changed. Like he was a, just a great big, he was like six foot six or six foot seven something. He was huge and he played the guitar and he sang and he was a comedian and like, um, super charismatic and just the kind of person that that you want to be around um so I looked forward to his visits even though um I think I was 14 and it was in the front yard of his best friend's house in my subdivision um he was going to leave and everybody was inside but there were neighbors outside and um he, he said, let me get one more hug from you before you go. And he leaned up against the tree and he kissed me. And I went to kiss him on the cheek, but he turned his head and he caught me on the mouth. And I remember it. the kiss lasted way too long. Um, and he stuck his tongue in my mouth. And um, I just kind of, just kind of pulled away and and jetted. I was like, bye, Pebble. See you later. And didn't speak to him for a while, but stayed in contact with my grandma and my aunt. Um, uh, and when I did, like, get back in contact with him, he acted like it never happened. And I guess in my head, I, I guess I made myself believe that it was um, an accident or a mistake, like he didn't really mean to do it or something. But by the time I was 20... And I lost custody of my son and gone through rehab and it didn't work and then got out and screwed up again and felt desperate and like I had nowhere else to go. Um, I was getting drug tested regularly and I knew I was going to fail the drug test and at that point probably lose all access to my son. Um, it was worth the risk going out to Oklahoma and I was an adult by then so I thought like all the, all the appeal would be gone for my grandfather. Um, that there was nothing to worry about, and they welcomed me with open arms. I still very much regret going out there, but I guess just like with anything in life and with anybody, there's good in most bad. There's There was a lot of good and a lot of healing that came out of that situation, but... Um, The bad definitely outweighed the good. Um, I stayed there for three, three and a half, maybe four months. I know I turned 21 while I was there. Um, and for the first month, month and a half, nothing happened at all with him. Everything was fine. Um, I got a job. I was working and I was part of the family. Um, my mom made me go to church, even though I was like a hardcore atheist, um, pissed me off, didn't want to go, but I did it out of respect for her and quickly got like the hang of things and, um, started to feel like a normal person again. They, even the kids pretty much just breathed life into me. Like, every day they tell me they love me and he would do like on Sundays when it was time to go to church I never wore dresses ever and I hated my my name because it was such a I don't know what the word is maybe masculine name um and everybody back home in Tennessee had a nickname for me that was even worse so he would take pictures he'd be waiting on the front porch when we left for church I'd take a picture of me in dresses and say he'd turn the camera around and make me look at it and he'd say 
that's a lady right there. Like, you're a lady. Remember that. You're a lady. Um, and I started to believe in. I started to feel like one. We also had a lot of conversations. He was really open about he never denied anything that he did um, to any of us. I guess I forgot I should back up. When I was five, my sister was four, was the first time um, that he crossed any lines with us. Um, Mama had took took us to Oklahoma for a visit, and um, we woke up one morning real early before everybody else, and we went to the bathroom, my sister and I together. In their bathroom, instead of a door, it had a shower curtain hanging as the door, one of the clear ones that you could kind of see through, and we could see him sitting on the toilet, and um, my sister opened the curtain a little bit, Oh, we saw him and jumped back and we were, we were like, oh no. And, you know, went to go back to the bedroom and he was like, no, no, it's okay. Come here. And we turned around and he had opened the curtain all the way and he was standing there, um, looming over us like six and a half feet tall, but naked. Um, just steady jacking it like we were his wife or something standing in front of him and he grabbed me by the wrist and pulled me closer to him and put my hand on his penis and um well that lasted for what felt like an eternity he had a sick smile on his face the whole time um I guess eventually I unfroze. My sister, I remember the look on her face. She was just frozen, like with this horrified, terrified look on her face. And um, I guess when I finally snapped out of it, I, I jerked away and I turned around and I took off running and I made it almost back to the bedroom and I realized she wasn't with me. And I went back to get her and she was standing there in front of him. He didn't grab her, he didn't make her touch him, but he was doing the same thing in front of her and she was standing there watching like with her little jaw dropped open. And I grabbed her by the arm and I pulled her and we ran back to my, the room, my mom and we were sleeping in and I thought we, just hid under the covers and went back to sleep. But when we went to trial a few years ago for my baby cousin who testified against him, who prosecuted him, we went to testify on her behalf. Mom told me that she was like, oh my God, I can't believe you remember that. We actually had told her what he had done. And I don't remember this, but she said that as soon as we came in there and told her, she packed our stuff and we left and... I think she let him come over maybe one time after that, and that's when it ended. <clears throat> so going back, and and there was some funky shit in between, but nothing like, nothing like horrible like what my mother went through, um, or my aunts. Um, he did some unspeakable shit to them, their entire lives. Um, so it was about a month and a half into my stay in Oklahoma, and um, he took me to meet a friend of his to see about buying a house there. My goal, I, like I said, I had gotten a job. My goal was to move my son out there. Um, my son signed the papers on the first house, and he took me up in the woods behind the house to show me around. I remember he had to unlock a, a chain on a gate and drive the car up a ways. Um, we got out and we were walking and I remember walking and walking and walking and thinking, why are, where are we going? Like, this is Oklahoma, it's not Tennessee. There's nothing to see, shit's flat and ugly. Like, where are we going? And um, 
I didn't hear him walking anymore, so I turned around. And he always did this thing, even whenever um, I was a young teenager. That day in his neighbor's yard, he would always put his arm up on a tree or um, like the post on a front porch or something. I don't know now looking back if it was to try to make himself look bigger or what, but he didn't need to be any bigger to be intimidating. But he had his arm up on a tree and he had that look on his face again. And I remember, um, again, I was 20 or 21 at this time. I remember um, thinking, run. Something in my gut told me that something bad was about to happen. I never imagined it was that, but I, I, I knew it. I knew it was something I, I didn't need to stick around for, it, but I froze like I was five years old again. Um, and he went in for the kill. Um, I think it must have been a Sunday because I had a skirt on. And those were the only days I wore a dress or a skirt. Um, He was never violent at all, just imposing, if that makes sense. Like, he didn't have to be violent. You just knew you didn't have a choice. Like, the way he moved with you, it never even crossed my mind to try to like fight back or scream or holler. Um, Later on, when it started happening regularly, I did try to fight back some, wriggle away, whatever, but it did no good. But that day, um, I didn't cry. Um, I just laid there and kind of just took it like I did back in Tennessee when I was on dope, when I had a needle in my arm, slept with some pretty disgusting vile men for drugs or money. And it's not like in the movies, like where they make it look like you can completely leave what your situation, what's going on, Um, but you kind of can. So I kind of did. I just waited for it to be over. I remember thinking it felt like a dream, like this isn't really happening. Um, not, Not because I didn't think he was capable of it. I just thought it wouldn't happen because I was grown. I wasn't a little girl and didn't have that same appeal anymore. And in the time that it took for him to get done doing what he did. Um, all, every bit of the positivity and the encouragement and the love that he um, had shown me to that point um, and just left. I was angry. It felt like he was fake and phony and it felt like I felt like I was the same dope sick junkie that pulled into his driveway 900 miles from home a month or so earlier um like it was nothing but lies and I think the only reason it stopped is because he heard a car coming and it was the landowner um He jumped up real quick and he was like, hurry, hurry, get your your clothes back on, hurry up, come on, let's go. And I couldn't hurry. I remember everything was in slow motion. Um, But I got up and I started to follow him out of the, the woods and he had given me a, a ring like a week earlier that looking back looked a lot like an engagement ring. Um, But he said, again, I was a lady and I deserved to have pretty things. So 
I was walking out of the woods behind him and I took the ring and took it off my hand and I threw it down in the woods. Um, I walked out with him to meet that man again and acted like nothing had ever happened. Like he was just showing me around. Um, I don't know why I didn't leave that day. But at this point, everybody back home was so furious with me and had made it clear that I wasn't welcome in their homes and with good reason, I deserved it. Um, I was a horrible person back then. I, I can't think of anybody I love today that I didn't hurt in some way back then. The second encounter with him, um, we stayed in a tiny house, very poor. I slept with my baby cousin um, in the same bed with her, in the same room, in a tiny little bed. She was a tiny little girl. Um, I thought she was seven, but doing the math now, I think she was five years old at the time. <clears throat> and, a parent, and they had custody of her. He was molesting her from the age of like two to 13. And that's what the trial was over. Um, I thought I knew what to look for and I thought, I thought that he wasn't messing with her, but he was. But in my mind that night, she was still completely naive and I wanted to keep it that way. I I'd also remembered my memo saying that she slept with one arm on him at night to make sure if he got out of bed that she would wake up and if he was gone from the room too long, she'd know to go look and check and see if years ago if her daughters were safe or now if her granddaughter was safe. Um, so when he came in our room that night, I panicked. He came in in nothing but fucking raunchy old Hottie Waddies and <clears throat> um, all I could think was my baby cousin's gonna wake up and she's gonna see this and if she doesn't, Mama will wake up and she'll walk in and see this and she'll think that I'm that I'm this horrible person that's doing this because I want to. Um that night I cried because, like I said, she was lay. my cousin was laying in the bed right beside me, like her body was touching mine, we were so close. Um, he climbed on top of me and I never hit him, but I was pushing him, trying to push him off of me, and I pulled my knees up to my chest trying to get him off of me, And but he was so, he was so huge, he was, there was no getting away from him. Um, his hands were so big that you could drop a quarter through his pinky ring. Um, he was just a massive man. I didn't want to make any noise because I didn't want to. I didn't want to wake anybody up. And ultimately, he got what he wanted that night again. The next day, I woke up furious and I went out to his shed where he was working. Um, he was building hammered dulcimers by hand. Um, and I told him that he was never, I basically, I basically said um, on my terms only, like if, if this shit's gonna happen while I'm here, it's gonna happen when I say and where I say. And that that means not with any chance of a baby cousin being exposed to it or my mama getting her heart ripped out. So he pretty much it he pretty much adhered to my rules that and I know that to most people this is gonna sound ridiculous and they're gonna be like you were twenty one years old. Why didn't you just leave? Why didn't you go to the cops? Why didn't you tell your grandmother? Why did 
why all these things. I can't answer those questions. I don't know. I only know that I really truly felt like I couldn't and like I was stuck. And a big part of me still felt like a child inside. And you have to understand too that to this day, I've never met a more like, I say this every time I talk about it, but I don't know how else to put it. Stealthy predator in my life. He was the best of the best in terms of being like a predator and a sociopath. He, he would bend grown men to his will just with a few words. There was no telling him no. And I guess if you don't know somebody like that in your life, it's probably hard to understand. But that aside, um, he never came in my room again with my baby cousin in there. And he generally always let me know it was time whenever my grandmother was gone. So this started to be um, a regular thing. Can't tell you how many times I had sex with my grandfather my biological grandfather, or I uh, allowed him to have sex with me, probably, probably 50 or 60 times while I was there. Um, I was able to get my son for two weeks um, during the time I stayed in Oklahoma. And on the trip to go get him, my grandfather took me and he said that it had to be just me and him, um, that he had business to take care of back in Tennessee when we got here. And he stopped to get a hotel, which wasn't necessary because he used to brag about how he didn't need to stop and sleep. He could do the drive round trip, no problem. And it was during that trip that um, in that hotel room for I don't know, close to 24 hours. It was nonstop over and over again. Like this man was in his late 50s, I think maybe. I, th I want to say he was born in 42 or something. Um, he was an old man, but like the sex drive of an 18 year old, he did things that um, if I was un if I was super uncomfortable with them, if it hurt, whatever, if I tried to get away, again, it's not like he hit me or anything, but he would just pull me back and make me do it anyway, um, or flip me over, or whatever. And I remember during <clears throat> during that like twenty four hours in the motel room, um, it just went on and on and on and. I think some part of me just caved and I tried to, it got to the point where I couldn't escape it mentally. So I had to be present for it. And um, it's so fucking hard to say. Um, yeah, the first orgasm I ever had was with my grandfather and I guess I got so used to the fact that this was happening and it wasn't going to stop that I got kind of numb to the horror of it all and um, there were there were times that I did my body, I guess, no, both. My body and my mind, I guess, liked what he was doing. Um, and I hated myself for that. I think I still do. It was revolting and disgusting. And that's a wild thing, like, to be To like, to like what somebody's doing to you, but be repulsed by it at the same time.
Sorry, can you ask me a question? So, the, the childhood abuse that you had with your father, do you see a connection with, with the... Certainly, you, you indicated before there's a connection with that and the abusive relationships you had after that, but I'm just wondering what, what this happened. This is in your 20s, right? Or early 20s? How, yeah. is it, how has this affected your later life? Yeah, so... How, how old are you today? I'm 33. 33. Um, I don't see really a connection with my father. Now, the man I married, yes. Um, as soon as I got back from Oklahoma, um, it took me close to two years, but I got custody of my son back. I've had him ever since. Um, and let me ask about... His wife, did, did she, she was aware of this? She suspected, and she was very angry then, I think. Now, she's, um, she feels responsible and guilty. Um, we've had a lot of talks about it. I think she forgives me. I know she still loves me, but to have gone through what all she's gone through, um, she's one of the most beautiful people I know. I don't think I could still love me. But my husband, um, I came back to Tennessee and uh, mm, just a few weeks into, into being back, I uh, met the man that, that I married. Um, we've been married 11 years and now currently, presently, and for the last few years, well, he always has worn overalls, and he's a giant man. Um, the only difference is he's brown, and my papa wasn't. And um, but he's got the long gray beard now. Um, he's twenty-seven years older than me. Um, I didn't care then. I thought I did think he was beautiful. Um, he didn't look his age. Uh, And I wanted stability and I wanted normal. Um, and for a little while I had that. Um, so I do see, a, I guess, like a, like a tie between the two. They're very much the same. The, the overalls, the gray beards, the narcissistic bullshit, the... Um, in a lot of ways, they're the same person. And I think the fact that n neither of them liked each other from the beginning probably probably should have been a big red flag. We let him, it gets sicker. I get sicker. Um, I left Oklahoma, and you would think that I would have never looked back, but he came to Tennessee when I was um, pregnant with, I didn't know it was a, a girl yet, but my second child and I was with my husband. He stayed with us for one night. Um, it was supposed to be a few days. Uh, um, and he sang a song right in front of my husband about when they had written about a girl with long black hair and green eyes kissing her under some trees in a like by a creek or some stupid shit. And my husband wasn't stupid. He, he picked up on it quickly. And um, the straw that broke the camel's back was the next day he walked in, my husband. I was there alone with my grandfather. He, my grandfather never tried anything 
during that trip in Tennessee when he came to see us. Um, but I was sitting at the kitchen table doing something, and right when my husband opened the door, my grandfather walked up behind me, and he put his hand around the back of my neck, and he leaned down, and I didn't realize I was making a face, but I guess I did, and my husband saw it, and he pulled me in the back bedroom, and he said, what's going on? Something's going on, and I told him nothing. Um, I just didn't want to be there if he was there. So um, long story short, Papa left that day, and I never saw him again because I went on to find out a couple months later that I was carrying a girl. And not my kids. Then I had another little girl. I never spoke to him through all these years. Um, and then three years ago, I got subpoenaed to testify for my baby cousin against him. And I was pregnant with my third little girl. Um, all of us came from all over the country to testify against him. And um, I was the only one on the stand. Um, the defense attorney asked me how I felt about being there that day, and I said, horrible, because I, love, I loved him very much. And I didn't want to see him put away in prison and hurt because I felt like he was just... He was just a very sick man, especially given the conversations that we had had about why he did the thing, why he thought he did the things that he did. I testified against him because I loved my baby cousin and his potential future victims more than him, but I still loved him and I didn't want to see anything awful happen to him. Um, I don't love him now. Um, he was convicted. He got seven years um, for what he did to her, and he died after only two years in prison. Um, he actually died um, a couple of weeks before I had already gone through all, all the loops. I had to go through all the hoops I had to jump through to go see him um being a victim they don't generally let you have a, a a visit with the perpetrator in oklahoma but i wanted him to see me now and see that i knew that he accepted my visit when he denied everybody else's because he thought he could still play one last game maybe but i needed him to see that uh I'm probably still pretty sick in the head, but I'm not his anymore, and I, I'm i not under his spell anymore. Um, and also tell him that, um, that I love him and I forgive him. I love the good in him, and I forgive the bad in him that hurt me so bad and the people I love so bad, but I never got that chance. Um, he died before I could go, so. And this was how many years ago? He died in December, almost a year ago. Oh, wow. So it's still fairly fresh. Yeah. Been disowned by his whole family except for two cousins. Um, they're all very angry with us for testifying and they're all very, very angry 
that myself and my aunt speak about it. Um, Because like I said, he was super charismatic and um, nobody could really believe that he was capable of the things that he did, but... I guess I need I need to make it clear that I understand that there's a big difference in um, what he did to all of us as children, especially what he did to my baby cousin, my aunt, and my mother, um, and then what happened when I was an adult. And I guess that's why I'm here today because. Nobody, um, it's um, it's a lot easier to say that things were done to you when you were an innocent child and you couldn't, you couldn't fight back or say no. But as an adult at any age, when you can and you just don't, there's like a huge amount of like, um, self-hate and guilt that comes with that and it's um, it's damn near taken me out a couple of times uh, so at court the DA told me that this is so common that she she hears about it so often I had to take her in a back room and tell her look just in case I don't want to you know a curveball thrown at you and my cousin's whole case get blown wide open in case he decides to say that this happened between us. And she said, this happens all the time. So if it happens all the time, that's news to me because I never hear people talk about it. And I think it needs to be talked about because it does happen, especially here in the mountains anyway. Um, I do feel responsible for my part in it. Um, but I also feel like people like Kim are really good at what they do. And I know the guilt that I, I live with. There's got to be so many other people out there living with the same. Um, and I guess my hope, like what I, what I hope for with this with this interview um, is maybe start a conversation about it where it's not so taboo to talk about. Um, maybe people like me reach out for help sooner and um, I also hope that maybe it would um, set me free, cause he's gone, but I'm not, and it's all still here and very real. So you were having sex with your grandfather, who was also at one point having sex with your mom, his daughter. Yes, but I need to make it clear that that, that was actual honest-to-God rape. Like, she fought back and said no. The last time that he raped her, she was 16, which is when she fell pregnant with me. And for much of my life, um, she told me when I was, um, I want to say I was about 15 or 16, that he could be my biological father. Um, and I lived in horror of that fact. Um, which also kind of, I don't know if catch-22 is the right word, but um, it felt disgusting, but at the same time, I thought um, 
anybody but my dad at the time. You know, I was an angry teenager, and I thought, even if it has to be this funky old backwards bullshit, at least I have maybe a shot at a dad that loves me and says he loves me and tells me I'm beautiful and et cetera, et cetera. And then whenever I moved to Oklahoma and I asked him about this, his take on it was that it was consensual sex in the back of his van, even though my mother was 16, his biological daughter. And yes, we know for sure it's biological because we've, mom and I have both taken a 23andMe test. Um, and all, many of his family members are on there. Um, he he said that it was consensual, and he went into graphic detail about what happened. And then he he scoffed and he giggled and he said, "That's ridiculous. I had a vasectomy after your aunt was born. Um, I never could have been your father." And then I remember also. Um, probably several weeks into, um, what do you call it, our, the sexual shit, him saying that um, he would love nothing more than to be able to come back home to East Tennessee and live in a cabin with me and have babies and spend the rest of his life living like a mountain man like he was meant to be, which was all a facade. He played this mountain man character in Oklahoma, but he wasn't. He was from a moderately big city and the straw hat and the cowboy boots and the overalls were all just a bullshit um, character he played. Um, but yeah, there was something really broken and really sick inside him. Um, thank God he did have a vasectomy or he probably would have been my father and I probably would have had at least one of his kids, just being honest. If you're 20 years old, how do you let your grandfather get away with this? How does this happen? Okay, so... It seems like you'd be old enough to protect yourself from... I was. Um, and I don't have, like, a black and white answer for that. But I think um, I think it was, like, a multitude of things. Number one, <clears throat> it was the memories of him, right? So I only had a couple of bad ones, but the rest were good. The memories of this big, giant Santa Claus papa that played the guitar and he sang this sneaky snake song and like everybody wanted a papa like that, right? And then and then my mom spending years telling us, no, 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 you can't talk to them. Well, like I said, I was rebellious as shit, so of course I'm going to do the opposite, right? Um, not realizing how dangerous it was and why she was saying no, 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 no. Um, then I think that being with my father, and I'm not, I'm not trying to bash him by saying this, but being with my father for so many years, um, if I hadn't have lived with him, I think it would have definitely gone down differently. But six years of 12 to 18, some of the most formative years in my life, um, I was taught every day that I had to submit or else and that I didn't have a choice. And um, having um, a male figure's will imposed on me, and it was just a fucking way of life. It just... It just was how it was. And then add on to that the four-year boyfriend, and it was the same shit. And there was nobody in this world I wouldn't fight. In fact, I stayed in trouble constantly in school and out for fighting, usually, usually females. But when it came to men, even if I had to fight them, I still, in the end, 
ended up submitting and doing what they wanted. So by the time I got to him, I've gone through all these years of conditioning from my father and and this shit boyfriend and and then the learning how to um I guess the word is disassociate um through my drug years or year ish um <clears throat> sleeping with strangers old men whatever so by the time I got by the time I got to him um he was like the ultimate. He was physically the biggest and personality was the biggest and he had the biggest presence and the strongest will. And it was almost like being um, uh, hypnotized is not the right word, but I, there was no saying no. It, it just never really crossed my mind as an option. And even when it ended, it wasn't like... I found the courage to do it myself. I got very, very sick and was in the hospital for um, over a week and they didn't think I was gonna make it. So my paternal grandparents drove from Tennessee to Oklahoma and I miraculously started to get better. And once I, once I got better, they asked me, I, I reckon they got tired of being angry with me. They asked me if I wanted to come home and man, we drove to that little house and I just threw all my shit. I grabbed shit left and right and threw it in my truck and I followed them back home. Um, and that's where I stayed with them until I met my husband. Um, if I hadn't got sick, I probably would have stayed, truth be told, for years. And he took your power away. He he took any choice you had away. There was no choice. And then, and I also felt like I'd probably gone wrong somewhere and done something wrong by continuing to speak to him when I was like 14 after the whole kissing thing and after all the shit when I was a little girl, maybe I'd given him the signal like as like a, like a, oh, it's okay thing like, maybe I had said or done something to make him think that that I was okay with it or that it was um, wanted or whatever, but it very, very much wasn't. And I think it was very obvious that it wasn't from the first time um, that he ever tried anything. Um, I don't, I don't know why I couldn't couldn't fight him off. I fought back with my dad. I fought back with boyfriends. I fought back with my husband after. I don't, I'm not sure, but um, he definitely did a good job of grooming also, like from childhood onward, always, always there to say no there's nothing wrong with you and no you're doing great and I love you and I support you and whatever you do and answering the phone anytime I called and kind of rushing in to save the day and um sending me gifts and um writing songs for me and about me and just doing anything you could to, like like it was flattering and I had never heard from a man in my entire in my entire life that I was beautiful or that I was a lady or that um that I could be anything I wanted to be even my good papa here in Tennessee like he was just a different he was my very best friend but a different breed of men like they just don't here in my family they just don't say things like that so to hear that from him um and to get the gifts and to get the attention and to get to get all the things that I think he knew I was starving for. Um, it was intoxicating. I don't know. And maybe that played a role in why I didn't say no because I could have.
put it in. Told you it took me two years to get my son back. Um, it was a lot of trial and error, methadone, suboxone, um, fucking up, falling off the wagon. Um, now, um, I take, um, benzos for sure. Um, but that's it. Need a knock on wood. Um, some days, a lot of days I want to get high. Um, But I'm not, um, losing my son for that, that couple of years and not even completely almost destroyed me. I can't imagine losing my girls and, and my, and my son there, my world, I would die if I lost them. Um, and trying to escape the girl's father um, it's probably not a good idea to go to court dirty, right? So, I'm good right now, but who knows? People stay clean for decades and then fuck it up. Secrets keep you sick, right? So... Thank you. Took a lot of courage for you to do that. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.